And it's my absolute pleasure to introduce our speaker for this evening. Um, Manoush Shafiq is the Deputy Governor of the Bank of England, and she has responsibility for markets and banking. She also happens to be the first woman who's ever held that position. She's responsible, amongst other things, for reshaping the bank's operations and for leading the bank's work to build fair, efficient and effective financial markets. So I think that's quite a challenge by anyone's standards. But she's no stranger to big portfolios. Um, before, before joining the bank in 2014, she was Deputy Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund. And before that, she was Permanent Secretary of the Department for International Development. Indeed, when Manoush was appointed to the bank, the Guardian described her as the economist with a stellar CV and now arguably the most powerful woman in the city. So having been a colleague of Manoush myself, uh, the only thing I would add is that she's also one of the nicest and most genuine people that I've ever had the pleasure of working with. Um, Manoush, I can't even begin to imagine how busy you are and what your sort of normal day-to-day -day schedule is. So I'm sure I speak for everybody here just to say we are incredibly grateful and very privileged that you have been able to spend time with us this evening. Um, because we've got Manoush for this amount of time today, please, as Manoush is talking, be thinking of the questions that you want to ask um, after she's finished speaking. Um, we really want to make the most of Manoush's time here, and the more difficult the question, I'm sure Manoush is going to rise to that challenge. So without further ado, um, please give a big warm welcome to Manoush Shafiq. Thank you very much for that very generous introduction. And, um, it's a real pleasure to be here. The last time that I, uh, I came to Warwick, I was very honored to get an honorary doctorate from, uh, from the university. And at that time, I gave a speech to a graduating class of enthusiastic students uh, about the value of education, the importance of purpose in one's professional life. And I reminded everyone to be grateful to their mothers. Today, I come to you as a central banker. And central bankers live in a sort of rarefied world where topics like mothers and things don't really come up very often. Uh, it's a world in which obfuscation has traditionally been preferable to plain English. <coughs> One of the best practitioners of that art was Alan Greenspan, who famously once said, I know you think you understand what you thought I said, but I'm not sure you realize that what you heard is not what I meant. <laughs> now the theme of my talk today is goodbye ambiguity, hello clarity. Uh, and what I'm going to talk to you about is how is about how the Bank of England's relationship with financial markets has moved away from a, from a history of ambiguity to one of greater clarity. And I'm going to use two examples to, to <coughs> illustrate that. Our balance sheet and how we gather market intelligence. Now, I appreciate my saying that may immediately think, why did I give up my Thursday evening to come here? Um, but what I'd like to do is make the case that a central bank <coughs> balance sheet and the way we understand financial markets is at the very heart of modern policymaking. And I'll also argue that this journey from constructive ambiguity, as it used to be called, toward greater clarity around how we interact with markets is essential for the effectiveness of a modern central bank. Now, the Bank of England's balance sheet is the means by which we create money and hence the source of all of our monetary policy responsibilities. It's the vehicle through which we provide liquidity insurance to the financial system and a crucial part of the financial stability objective. It's also the point at which the implementation of macroeconomic policies interact with the micro-reality of individual financial institutions. And in all of these, the bank has proven very agile to respond to the financial crisis and the changes in its responsibility. Just as important, our, our interaction with markets gives us a window through which to gather information about developments in financial markets. And we refer to this as market intelligence. And the purpose of that is that the bank's policy decisions need to be made and implemented with a detailed understanding 
of the financial market context in which we operate. And the way we go about <coughs> doing market intelligence is changing, as set out in a review that we've published in our launching today, in fact, exactly 6 o'clock this evening. Uh, and I'll take the opportunity to talk you through uh, what the main points are. A recurring theme, as I said, is that the constructive ambiguity, which was seen as a helpful foil for central banks for many years, those days are behind us. In today's complex and globalized financial markets, governors' <coughs> eyebrows and fireside chats, as, it's, as they used to be, are no match for clearly communicated a framework in which information is gathered and decisions will be made. So let me step back and tell you a little bit of history a little history of money and liquidity provision. And I'll begin uh, from the beginning. The Bank of England was founded in 1694 during a time with, of war with France, and things never change, and was tasked with arranging a 1.2 million pound <coughs> loan to a government that was having serious financial difficulties. And this was funded by members of the general public. Uh, and dividend day, when members of the public came to the Bank of England to collect their dividends, is still immortalized in a painting that we have that hangs in the bank still today. At that time, there was much excitement about the idea that a stable banking system could be a source of liquidity to fund the expansion of the economy. And so in addition to being the government's banker, the Bank of England at the time also engaged in commercial activities taking deposits in exchange for issuing notes and providing loans by discounting commercial bills. That was 321 years ago. The Bank of England you see today has its roots in a relatively more recent act of parliament. I refer, of course, to the 1844 Bank Charter Act. Don't worry, I'm not going to go through all the long history, which paved the way for the bank to become the monopoly supplier of banknotes and effectively responsible for monetary policy in the UK. That act also had the effect of limiting the amount of commercial business the bank did, and, and instead it chose to concentrate not on competing with the emerging joint stock and clearing banks, but instead focusing on its role as the banker <coughs> to the banks and a supplier of liquidity of last resort. And it could be argued that it was at that point that the bank got its financial stability role. <coughs> In subsequent years, the bank sought to redefine this role, and it was helped, as always, <coughs> by the advice of Walter Badgett, a keen student and sometimes critic of the way the bank had reacted to banking crises over its history. By 1873, Badgett had seen enough to declare that the correct policy for the bank to pursue in order to head off incipient panic in the market would be to, quote, lend freely and vigorously on all good banking securities but to do so only at a very high rate of interest that no one may borrow out of idle precaution. So that was his advice to us. Badgett had two other pieces of advice for the bank and that are relevant today. First, he advised that it should be, quote, a clear understanding between the bank and the public, since the bank holds the ultimate banking reserve and it will recognize and act on its obligations. And second, he advised that the deputy governor must be, quote, a man of fair position who, quote, must not have to say sir to the governor. It's a slightly old-fashioned way of saying that the deputy governor should be independent-minded, that our staff should be empowered to speak their minds, and that we must always remain credible with the public. Even though Badgett foresaw many things, even his liberal mind hadn't foreseen the day when the Bank of England might have more than one deputy governor and that one of them might be a woman. So let me then <coughs> fast forward. From a 1.2 million loan to the government in 1694, the bank's balance sheet has now grown enormously and has come a long way to its current size of 400 billion. And let me just show you the most the, the sort of evolution of the bank's balance sheet as a share <coughs> of GDP. And most of that expansion has actually happened in the last seven years. Uh, in large part reflecting the implementation of monetary policy since the financial crisis that started in 2008. Now, maintaining credibility of the money that we issue has been an objective of the bank from its inception. And since the early 1990s, that's been pursued through an inflation targeting regime in which the most, the sort of tool of choice has been the interest rate. In the wake of the financial 
crisis and the ensuing recession, however, bank rate, the rate that we charge to the banks, that we charge that we, that we remunerate banks for their reserves, was cut to a historic low of 0.5%, a level that at the time was considered the effective lower bound, uh, below which would reduce the profitability of banks and constrain the supply of credit to the economy. But when more stimulus was needed, the Monetary Policy Committee used a different tool, something called the Asset Purchase Facility, to deliver the needed stimulus to the economy and expand the balance sheet using newly created central bank reserves to purchase 375 billion of government bonds with a range of maturities out to 55 years. Now, of course, what was once considered radical has become mainstream by today's standards. Indeed, other central banks have gone even <coughs> gone further as the circumstances of their economies have required. The European Central Bank and the Bank of Japan have stated their intention to purchase significant amounts of private sector assets. And some central banks have used their balance sheets to purchase other countries' assets with the aim of maintaining their exchange rate at a certain level. The key point is that even though interest rates had been the marginal tool of monetary policy for several decades, Monetary policymakers never forgot that this was just one manifestation of the central bank's unique ability to create narrow money. And when the effective lower bound was reached, stimulus could continue to be provided by ex expanding central bank's balance sheets in new ways. Someone recently said to me that this policy, which we now call quantitative easing, is like magic, as if central bankers were sorcerers who could conjure up economic miracles. I wish. <laughs> in fact, quantitative easing works through a much more prosaic channel of reducing long-term interest rates in the economy and encouraging the private sector, encouraging private sector investment in riskier assets by reducing the supply of long-duration government bonds, a phenomenon we now call portfolio rebalancing. But the underlying point that the effect of this new monetary policy tool is less intuitively understood is well taken. And that makes effective communication and accountability important to monetary policy and indeed to all central bank policies. These points were made very clear in a recent review by Kevin Warsh, who reviewed the transparency of the Monetary Policy Committee and published his findings quite recently. So as a result of his recommendation, as of this August, the Monetary Policy Committee will publish the minutes of its policy meetings and the inflation report at the same time as it announces its policy decisions giving markets and the public a clear understanding of what underlies the judgments that we have made. Looking forward, it seems to me that the most likely next move in monetary policy will be a gradual and limited rise in interest rates. The current weakness in headline inflation is, reflects transitory, albeit very sizable factors, such as the 50% recent decline in oil prices and the appreciation of sterling over the last two years. But the underlying picture is one in which domestic demand is expected to continue to grow robustly, facilitating a pickup in wage growth, which we're starting to see, and that inflation will return to trouble in a few years. But we don't have a crystal ball, and should circumstances turn out differently, the Monetary Policy Committee has the means, the will, and the responsibility to get inflation back to 2%. On the upside, should the remaining slack in the economy be absorbed more quickly than expected, we can raise rates more quickly than currently implied by market yields. On the downside, should we perceive that low inflation is going to is beginning to have self-reinforcing effects through inflation expectations, we'll still have several tools at our disposal. We could increase rates more slowly than currently implied by market yields. We could expand the asset purchase facility and expand our balance sheet even further. And we could also cut bank rate further. The banking system is now operating with substantially more capital and it can see the aftermath of the crisis and a reduction of bank rate is less likely to have undesirable effects on the supply of credit in the economy. Someday, we'll also have to exit quantitative easing, although that won't come until bank rate has reached a level from which it could be materially cut should we need a more stimulus <coughs> in the future. Such a decision will be taken in pursuit of our inflation target, but I can assure you this will be done in an orderly and clearly communicated fashion so as not to disrupt financial markets, and also including close coordination with the debt management office. 
Let me turn to a different topic, which is how the balance sheet has evolved to provide liquidity insurance to the financial system. In the decades prior to the crisis, the need for the bank to provide liquidity support to the financial system was very infrequent and usually on a very small scale. As such, in 2007, the bank had a relatively limited list of institutions who were our counterparties, who we gave them to, uh, in, in what was called, what's called the Sterling Monetary Framework, along with a very conservative list of collateral that we would expect it, we would accept in our published facilities. And there was very little clarity about the circumstances under which the bank would extend liquidity support for financial stability purposes. So despite this less than ideal starting position, the bank ultimately embraced the provision of liquidity to the system over the course of the crisis, with the express aim of reducing the costs of disruption to critical services. <coughs> this came about by an alphabet suit of schemes. We had the DWF, the ECTR, the ELTR, the FLS, the ILTR, and the SLS. I won't expect you to work it through what all those acronyms mean. So the common to all of them was a recognition that to achieve its aim, the Bank of England needed to provide liquidity against a wider range of collateral to a wider range of counterparties for a longer term. Two other innovations were really noteworthy. First, in some circumstances, the bank lent in a currency other than sterling, a first for our liquidity finance operations. And second, the bank acted as a market maker of last resort in the sterling corporate funding markets, making small targeted purchases in sales of commercial paper and corporate bonds to try and restore order in those markets. Now, many of those changes were made in the heat of the crisis. And since the 2012 Winters and Plenderleaf reviews, much effort has been exerted in hardwiring those innovations into our permanent operating framework to make it clear to market participants how we would act in the future. As this figure shows, this shows the number of, of counterparties of financial institutions who can now have access to our balance sheet. And you can see it has gone up. The membership of the Sterling Monetary Framework has increased dramatically from 70 prior to the crisis to 139 and counting. And the collateral we accept now extends from AAA bonds all the way down to owned, role, owning raw loans. <coughs> Changes such as these provide the basis for what Governor Mark Carney recently said, the declaration that the Bank of England is, quote, open for business. I think the changes that we made since 2007 indicate that not only are we open for business, but we're increasingly open about our business. The Winters report highlighted that the ambiguity around the, the, the bank's published liquidity insurance framework was rarely constructive. And the bank is committed to providing clarity on the circumstances under which it would provide liquidity in the event of market-wide or large idiosyncratic stresses. Our red book clearly states the aims and objectives of the Sterling Monetary Framework. Each participant in the Sterling Monetary Framework has a relationship manager who gives clarity to them about the circumstances when they can expect to borrow from the bank payment. We've improved our external accountability by producing an annual report overseen by the bank's court to describe how the framework has performed every year. But hardwiring those lessons learned during the last crisis uh, will not necessarily provide the agility we need uh, and may require in the future. For that reason, our approach to liquidity insurance continues to evolve. So in November 2004, we extended eligibility in membership to the Sterling Monetary Framework to broker dealers and central counterparties, giving non-banks access to the Sterling Monetary Framework and liquidity insurance for the first time. We've also expand, continued to expand the range of acceptable collateral. We started to approve pools of auto loans and invoice finance receivables as eligible collateral for the first time. And we're, we're also starting work to ensure that there are no technical obstacles to us accepting equities uh, as collateral should the need arise. The bank will also commence work in the second half of this year to assess the feasibility of creating a Sharia compliant facility to provide uh, liquidity insurance for Islamic financial institutions in the UK. And we're continuing to develop our capacity to lend in currencies other than sterling. 
Although we've put providing clarity of how the central bank would react in the event of a market-wide or idiosyncratic stress, it's important that some of our facilities retain elements of discretion. For example, the benefits of the discount window facility, the emergency liquidity assistance that we can provide, could be undermined by immediate disclosure. Uh, if speculation about an individual firm, for example, could threaten financial stability. In this respect, both the Winters and Plenderleys reviews uh, reports recognize that a lag between usage of our facilities and public disclosure can provide a balance between our financial stability objective and our duty to be accountable to the public. <coughs> Let me move on to the issue of microprudential supervision, supervision of individual institutions. Historically, one of the main arguments about having ambiguity about the bank's provision of liquidity insurance, particularly around a wide range of collateral, was that clarity would induce moral hazard. The more certain banks could be that they could that they could have liquidity insur assur insurance from the Bank of England, the less incentive they would have to manage their own liquidity, liquidity prudently to private markets. And one didn't want to encourage that sort of bad behavior. But acting as a mitigant against this, the expansion of the bank's liquidity provision capabilities has gone hand in hand with two other key developments, which have changed the nature of the argument. First, the introduction of stronger liquidity requirements requiring banks to hold more liquid assets. And this chart illustrates that where you can see that banks in the UK are now holding much higher levels of liquid assets uh, on their own, on their own, of their own choice. And the second thing that's changed that is the creation of a resolution regime which makes it more credible uh, that firms will be allowed to fail in an orderly manner. Taken together, liquidity insurance, the resolution regime, and microprudential supervision provide a framework of incentives to help banks manage their own liquidity. And the coexistence within the Bank of England makes coordination of those policies substantially more straightforward. Having supervisors within the bank close at hand to help inform decisions about the provision of lender of last resort facilities is incredibly helpful. That means the bank needs to make this judgment about whether to lend and whether a firm is viable in the medium term and whether the bank itself has a credible exit strategy. In practice, we know that distinguishing between illiquidity and insolvency can be very difficult. And a close understanding of a firm is invaluable to providing the information needed to judge the long-term viability of a firm's business model and in providing short-term assessments about liquidity provision. The sharing of that information with the existence of supervision in the Bank of England now could, of course, have been up if it was separate. But my, my experience so far has been that having supervisors a lot sitting alongside those making decisions around lender of last resort under one roof greatly enhances our ability to coordinate and optimize policy in the public interest. Now let me turn to the other aspect of our interaction with financial markets, which is market intelligence. Given our responsibilities for market policy, financial stability, and the supervision of individual institutions, it's quite right that people expect that the bank's policy decisions are taken with a very deep understanding of what's happening in financial markets. And since its inception, the bank's market operations have provided a key input into the, the policy making of the institution. And between the years 1786 and 1989, this, this role of transmitting information about what's happening in markets to policymakers in the bank was epitomized by someone with a splendid title of the senior broker to the commissioners for the reduction of the national debt. Uh, I can show you what they looked like. Uh, these gentlemen, invariably clad in a top hat uh, with a tightly rolled umbrella, had a position and were responsible for announcing in person changes in the bank's minimum lending rates to the city and at the same time gathering opinion from market participants in the city on the state of the guilt market. And he was expected to report to the guilt hedge division three times every day, uh, 
providing information about market activity, the quantity of buying and selling, and the guilt maturities and coupons that were in particular demand. He was also responsible for reporting to the bank about the mood of investors and advising the bank on the appetite for stock, institutional cash, positions, and expectations. So this was really the origins of what we now call market intelligence. And even if the top hats are a thing of the past, although we still have one in the Sterling Markets Division to, in memory of the senior brokers to the commissioners for the reduction of the national debt, um, even if the top hats are a thing of the past, the essence of market intelligence gathering remains the same. That our staff maintain a regular dialogue with financial market participants to draw on their expert knowledge and perspective in the markets in which they operate. And this takes place through bilateral meetings, group discussions, phone calls, all of which supplement the screens and the data analysis on our modern trading floor. But compared to the time of the senior broker, the coverage of market intelligence has expanded dramatically. The markets in which the bank now operates, the tr our traditional markets, the short-term money market, fixed income, currency market, continue to provide the natural starting point for our market intelligence function. But in recognition of the fact that the risks and the threats that, the, that might threaten our ability to achieve our core mandate may have their origins in many more places, coverage has now expanded to 23 different markets. So we have teams in the bank who cover 23 markets ranging from structured products to emerging markets to the commercial real estate market uh, to the bond market. And that's covered by 80 analysts across the bank who part of whose job is to keep track of what's happening in those key markets. That first-hand information differs from what we can gather from our Bloomberg screens, our analyst reports and research, and it provides an important perspective on both short-term moves and long-term trends. And it permeates every part of the organization. Every morning, the governors of the bank meet and get an in-depth briefing on what's happened in financial markets that day from Chris Salmon, our executive director for markets. And part of my job is to brief the Monetary Policy Committee at each of our meetings on recent developments and their implications for monetary policy. Market intelligence also feeds into the more strategic issues about and the policy decisions of the committees. For example, the difficult decision that the Monetary Policy Committee had to take about what the effective lower bound to interest rates was, was in part informed by the opinion of our money market desk who were able to tell the NBC what, what was the market pursuing at that particular time. And I expect market intelligence to play a key role in informing the Financial Policy Committee's pursuit of its medium-term aim of making sure that we have diverse and resilient sources of market-based finance. We've had many recent episodes, like the sharp decline in the US Treasury market in October, the 50% decline in the oil price, and the removal of the Swiss private peg recently that reminded us that volatility uh, in financial markets has not been consigned to history. So a key question for the Financial Policy Committee and the Board of the Prudential Regulatory Authority is whether markets are able to recover from these shocks or whether they're symptomatic of underlying fragility. And market intelligence can play a key role in informing those judgments. But the expanded responsibilities of the bank have also meant that elements of our approach need to be strengthened. And in particular, a recent report by Lord Gravener indicated concern that our systems and controls have not kept pace with the changing role of the bank. And so today, we're publishing the results of a thorough review that we have done of our market intelligence function. And in it, I highlight three key points uh, that remove some of the unconstructed ambiguity that have governed this activity. First, we're publishing a market intelligence charter, which explains in very clear language to the markets why we collect this information and how we will use it. Second, we're strengthening the set of policies in terms of escalation, compliance, record keeping, and training of our own staff to make sure that, these, that that intelligence is, is carried out in a responsible way. And third, the bank is establishing a, a committee internally to oversee and agree the priorities to make sure that we're collecting intelligence about the policy challenges that are most critical to the bank for both today and for tomorrow. 
The ability of our market intelligence to inform senior policymakers in the bank over the last eight years as the first waves of the crisis hit us and then as the solutions flowed out has been absolutely vital to our effectiveness. And the staff who do this work are really are a credit to the institution. As public servants, they contribute every day to delivering our mission to promote the good of the people of the United Kingdom by maintaining monetary and financial stability. And the changes we're making public today will ensure that they can continue to do that important work effectively. Let me uh, draw to a conclusion. The bank balance sheet has been at the heart of the financial system for over 300 years, and it remains our most important policy tool. The innovations and adaptations in recent years have meant that it's been central to the flexible and effective response to all of the major policy challenges faced by the bank since the onset of the crisis. And I'm sure it will be a vital part of everything we do in future. Over that period, we have relearned one of Badgett's lessons, that ambiguity is rarely constructive, that policy is at its most effective when it's clearly communicated. And we've taken major steps to improve communications around our monetary policy decisions, about the framework we will use to provide liquidity to the financial system, and the way we will use market intelligence. These changes show that the Bank of England isn't just open for business, but it will also open about our business. Thank you very much.